Okay everyone, this is a presentation on Trout and August Midnight <clears throat> and really the fundamentals of this presentation can be applied to any of your paired comparison essays in the poetry section. Everything that you need to know in relation to the, the facts of the poem um, will be in your flirt grids but as this little um, cartoon shows you you really have to try and bring your own interpretation into this question. Remember, you've got four assessment objectives here. Will I find the wee pen tool? I think that's it. So you've got, oh, no, that's not it. Hold on, there it is. So you've got A, O, 1. You're going to have to address the question. We're going to look at the question in the middle, in the minute. And that means you're going to have to use the key term of the question in every paragraph, every single one. And don't be worried about using the exact key term. It's not going to make it sound repetitive. It's going to show the examiner that you understand and are addressing the question. Righty-ho. The next thing that you have to do is your A02. Now, this is where your flirt grids are invaluable because all of the A02, all of the information in relation to poetry methods, that's all on your flirt grid. So learn it. You need to have a clear and concise understanding of every single technique here. Then you're going to have, let's see if I can get a different colour, A03. Now this is the comparative aspect. So once you've written a point on Heaney's use of language, you're then going to connect it using a connecting word to Hardy's use of language all the way through. One thing on Heaney, one thing on Hardy. It doesn't have to be in that order. It can be Hardy Heaney. It really doesn't matter. But you cannot go off on one on one poet if you're not going to mirror that point and connect it to the other poet. And then finally, finally, I've only got three colours. Well, I'll have to go back to red. Okay. <clears throat> A04. So that's your biographical information. The biographical information will be embedded into the flirt grid, but remember there are key quotations that you can use in relation to Heaney and Hardy, and we'll talk about those later. Okay, let's get going. Right, so <clears throat> this is your question, as you can see. Let's look at the question, let's unpick it. Right, it tells you the poems that you have to focus on, so this must be one of question one, question one, because it tells you the poems. Question two, remember you only choose one question. Question two will only tell you one of the poems, so it might just say trite. And then you have to make the connection yourself with another poem, a similar poem that has that theme. If I look at my question, I can clearly see that the theme there is the natural world. So I'm going to have natural world, nature, the world of nature, whatever way I want to express it. But I could just say natural world in every single paragraph. Now, this is a shortened version of a question because every single question has the personal response element. Personal response. Okay, so you need to embed that into your paragraph, every paragraph, using our lovely Peter. Okay, and I'll show you that later on. Right, let's go. Now, <clears throat> every single one of your flirt crids start... Ooh, making lines already, every single one of your flirt grids starts off with a bit of information on context and theme. Now, once you have completed your introduction, and remember your introduction is a really important thing, because what it has to do is it has to reflect the question, that's natural world, it has to indicate your argument, what you think is, is the argument in relation to both poets. So for example, it could be that you think that uh, Hardy sees the natural world too often through human eyes, whereas Heaney sees the natural world um, through the eyes and experience of the animals themselves. So you've got your argument and then you have to present an overview. And the presentation of an overview is your overview of, of what these two poems are about or maybe something about the two poets. And remember, we did the introduction to this in class. Go back and have a look at it. Okay, <clears throat> but once you've got your RIP done, you've done your introduction, then you, and also this bit here can be included in the introduction if you wish, or it can be a separate paragraph. It's really up to you. But what I think you have to do is you have to show the examiner that you understand the poem. You understand the themes of the poem. 
So if you look at the, and by understanding the theme, you'll naturally find your argument. Because once you read this about Hardy's, or sorry, Heaney's, Heaney, remember Heaney's in blue. So once you read this about Heaney's uh, themes, and you read this about Hardy's themes, you can clearly see where the differences lie. And it's that difference, it's the identification of that difference in every paragraph that makes up your argument. So look at this. The poem of Heaney here is essentially an, an attempt to explore the essence of the fish, not as it appears in human eyes, as much as it defines the creature in its own world. Heaney's rural background allows him to view the natural world in a way that is unsentimental, lovely word, and avoids adopting a superior attitude. Now, so there you go. There's a wee bit of your AO4, your biography, that he has the, the rural background and unsentimental view of the animal world, of the natural world. But there, that's the central theme of this poem. It's about trying to capture the essence of a fish. It's all about that idea of sensory experience. For you, the reader. But it's not about seeing the fish through human eyes as such. It's trying to see the animal in its own world. Whereas, bish bosh bosh over to Hardy, you can clearly see that even though he focuses on the natural world by looking at the insects, really, he is still focusing on himself. He's focusing on his idea that Animals perhaps are our own kind. There's a nice wee bit of AO4 that you can always use for Hardy in relation to animal poetry. But he he's always at the heart of it, really. It's always his view of the animals, how the animals are in, compa in comparison to him. So it's not really about the animals themselves. It's not really about the natural world itself. It's about Hardy or the speaker's relationship with the natural world. Whereas Heaney is talking about the natural world detached from human eyes, detached from the human world. Hardy's always at the centre of his, okay? Maybe he's got a big ego or something, I don't know. But he, it's him and his belief and the speaker's belief and the speaker's relationship with the natural world that makes the, um, that makes the centre point of this poem. You have that idea at the very end that the speaker concludes that perhaps even the most humble in the universe surpasses humans in terms of philosophical understanding. The most humble. Why do we think of them as humble? There's nothing humble about that trout. That trout is a force of nature. So what you have here is a very clear view of Hardy and the human relationship with the natural world. And what you have with Heaney is a very clear understanding of trying to take the human out of the equation and see the fish for the dynamic force that it is in its own world. Remember, think of Steve Backshaw and Deadly Sixty. Right, let's go. Next one. Okay, now look at the form. Is there anything there that you can say in relation to A01 natural world? There we go. Okay, maybe there is. The idea that for Hardy then, the natural world at the start of his poem in stanza one intrudes into the world of the human and then in stanza two, there seems to be that movement to try and think about the insects in their own world. So it's, it's a movement from the human world to the world of nature in stanza two and the form makes that obvious. Whereas for Heaney, perhaps the form is not as important in relation to the theme. Um, and again, that's something that you can say because this is all about comparisons and contrasts. So form is here for Hardy. Maybe it is mimicking the theme that we start off in the world of the human and then we move into, in stanza two, into the natural world itself and try to find out what is the relationship between the human world and the natural world. And then for Heaney, the form of the poem perhaps is not as relevant to the theme. And that's fine. That's not a criticism of the poem. That's just you showing the examiner that you can understand. OK, off we go. Language. Now, folks, there is so much to say on language. So much. And for you, what you need to do is you need to read through the Heaney language and the Hardy language and make your connections. So, for example, the worked paragraph that we did in class, we based it on diction choices. Okay, so 
Remember, 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 we have to have AO2. We need to have technique here. We need to show the methods. So we're going to be talking about um, language in a technical way. So I'm going to talk about diction choices. Okay, diction. Or another way you can say that is you can say the lexicon used. Okay, diction choices, lexicon used, fancy ways of saying words. But again, that's a technique. That's a technique. And we need technique because we need AO2. Now, there's no way around this, folks. You have to do this yourself. You have to think back to that opening little um, image that I had. You know, you're not a robot. You can think for yourself. There are so many connections that you could make similarities and comparisons so there's no need for everybody's essay to be exactly the same you pick what you can really explain what you can analyze so when i did this paragraph in class folks if you remember what i did was i focused on heaney and his real focus on verbs why is he using the verbs? He's using the verbs because what he wants to do is he wants you to see that activity, action, power, those are the things that the fish is synonymous with. Those are the things that he's trying to link the fish to. So the reason why he uses the verbs is because this is a fish of action. It is a powerful fish in its own habitat and therefore Verbs will be my main point in my first paragraph on language. And then what I did with that is I compared it to Hardy. Now for Hardy, it's not verbs um, that really, uh, you know, verbs do not dominate his thinking in that opening stanza. Instead, he focuses on adjectives. And all of those adjectives are there to create some sense of uh, peace, tranquility, calm, um, completely opposite to what um, Heaney's doing with trite. So what I wanted to do is show this as a contrast. Now let's go to our wonderful Peter paragraph that we did in class to show how we do this. Right so I've gone back uh, and hopefully everything else has been saved but I wanted to come back here because what you have to do now you've done a perfect pair of Peter paragraphs um, but what you have to do now is find another connection, another language connection. So if you have a look through here, there are so many things that you could connect. For example, you've got the semantic field of the battlefield that um, you have with Heaney's poem, suggesting the power, on, the power of the trite, the idea of the creature as a weapon. Whereas when Heaney talks about the natural world. There is a sense of threat there with the adjectives of winged, horned and spines, but they don't appear so much as a weapon. They, they appear weird, they appear alien. And therefore that might be the foundation stone of another pair of Peter paragraphs. It's really up to you where you make those connections. You could connect that with that if you wish, or there might be something else that you want to connect further on. If we look at the next So if we get here, um, there might be something else that you'd like to connect. For example, the emphasis on pronouns that um, Heaney uses when he talks about we five, he equates himself with his insect visitors. They are his guests, but, but also that idea that humanity and the natural world are on a par. Again, that links into his AO4, if you remember, he thinks that humans and animals are of their own kind. Of their own kind. He puts such emphasis on that pronoun we whereas for Heaney pronouns are cut out because by taking the pronoun out of the poem what he does is, is he puts the emphasis on the verbs so it's not about the the um the animal as an individual it's about the animal as a powerful force a force of nature so pronouns are important for Heaney or for, sorry pronouns are important for Hardy but they're certainly not important for Heaney in relation to the natural world and it's up to you it's up to you where your connections lie but you've got to have about oh I would say at least two pairs of language paragraphs because you've only got 45 minutes and you've got to go on to imagery you've got to get tone in there and you've got to get rhythm and rhyme as well 
So here we are. Now you can see at the top, I have all I've done is I've taken the little extract from my flirt grid where I want to talk about verbs for Heaney. And then I've gone to my little flirt grid and I'm talking about adjectives for Hardy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect them. Now remember, what we're doing here is we're thinking of the lovely Peter Andre. We've got him there. Think of his rippling biceps. Okay, point sentence. It's going to be short. It's going to reflect my question. Now, I cannot, I cannot write one paragraph here which will combine Heaney and Hardy. I'm going to have to split it into two. But my opening point sentence is going to indicate, is going to indicate what connects these two paragraphs. So if you have a little look here, my point sentence says, diction choice makes the poet's differing views on natural world obvious. Look, lovely. I'm attending to the question. I have got natural world there. And my examiner knows that this pair of paragraphs will be about diction choices. Okay. Now, I have chosen my evidence. There we go. Evidence. I'm going to talk about hangs. And I'm going to talk about the phrase picks off for Heaney. And in relation to Hardy, I'm going to talk about the word shaded, the word waving and the phrase distant floor. So that's the evidence that I'm going to use. I've already identified what my technique is there. It's diction choice. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to break that down into more specific diction choices. I'm going to talk about verbs here. OK, and I'm going to maybe bring in a bit of pronoun here. And look, there's my verb phrase again. Now, what's a verb phrase? It's just a verb combined with another word. Picks is your verb off. OK, so have a wee look at this. I've got my techniques. I'm now going to explain what I mean. And this is really where our Peter paragraph falls down, because I'm doing more than explaining. I'm analysing. I'm breaking down these little quotations. But we can't have a picture of Peter Andre if it's spelled P-E-T-A-R. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to break these down, break down the evidence. And if finally, I'm going to bring it all back to the reader because it's all back to me. Why does it have to all come back to me? Because the question is about personal response. Remember? And if I do it after every paragraph, I don't have to stick it on in the end like something that I'd forgotten about. My examiner can see that personal response is at the heart. OK, so let's read through this perfect Peter paragraph. Diction choice makes the poet's differing views on natural world, on the natural world obvious. The reliance Heaney places on verbs, there's your technique, is a deliberate means of making the action and forcefulness of the trite clear. All of that I learned from my flirt grid. By beginning his poem with the verb hangs, omitting the use of a pronoun, Heaney makes the trite appear in control of its natural environment. So look there, that's my evidence. And what I'm doing here is I'm analysing it. I'm picking it apart. What does that verb do without the pronoun? It makes it seem as if the trite is controlled of its natural environment. And look, what's that doing? It's reflecting the question, isn't it? Natural environment, natural world. Now, this is my beautiful bit of reader response, which brings a little bit of analysis in as well and lets the examiner know that I truly understand this poem. As a reader, we are surprised by the par, it and other verb phrases such as picks off, connote, in relation to a creature that is often seen by humans just as a food source. Heaney's decision to place the fish in its natural world. Look, I can't get sick of that wee quick key quotation. I want to drill it into my examiner's head. Makes it appear a potent and dynamic fish, constantly active. Look, lovely reader response in relation to what the technique is doing. My examiner is practically doing a handstand with happiness. Now, that's great, but I'm not finished yet because now I have to think about AO3. I have to connect it to Hardy. So let's do that. So I've already said that it's Dick's and Choice that link the two poets' view in the natural world together. So with this one, I've got a little short point sentence that makes my AO3 apparent and there it is contrasts this sense of action contrasts with hardy's opening diction choice because remember that was my original point sentence diction choice 
and look another AO3 word, unlike. So contrasts and unlike. Unlike Heaney, his poem doesn't begin in the natural world at all. Oh, Max Amner's going, this person knows what they're doing. Rather, Heaney uses adjectives to describe the tranquil, tranquil, that was uh, <clears throat> a, a little bit of a mispronunciation there, but sure, who cares, uh, to describe the tranquil domestic scene of the speaker's study. In this human environment, all is calm and muted with the shaded lamp and the distant floor. Now look, there we go. Got those nice little um, diction choices. And what are these? Well, these are adjective phrases if I really want to be posh. Because they're all built on the adjective. Shaded lamp, adjective noun, distant floor. Adjective noun. So they're adjective phrases or adjectival phrases. Doesn't really matter. Diction choice will do. But if you want to blow your examiner's mind, off you go. So through the diction, now here what I'm doing is I'm analysing this, I'm breaking it apart. Through the diction, Hardy makes the cosy human world appear settled and relaxed. Back to my reader response. For the reader, there is a nonchalant tone here that is in direct opposition to the natural world of energy and alertness created by Heaney's verbs. Lovely wee bit of AO3 at the end and a clear bit of personal reflection that for me it's in opposition to the natural world. Which do I prefer? Well from reading this it seems I prefer Heaney's and that's great. So there you have a perfect pair of Peter paragraphs in relation to language but folks that's only in relation to one language element. If I can go back, I don't know, I've never gone back before, let's give it a go. Okay, oh the wee line there. Again, we're on imagery now. So let's think, what have we got so far? We've got our introduction, which is RIP. We've got our four, we've got our context and theme paragraph, which could be a separate paragraph or could be put into our introduction. We've got a paragraph on form. It's short really, isn't it? Because we didn't have too much to say. We should by now have two paragraphs on language and by that I mean two pairs of paragraphs on language and now you've come to imagery. What are you going to do here? If you could get two paragraphs on imagery that would be super, that would be perfect if you could. If not then you think of the most important points in relation to imagery, the most important point in relation to Heaney's use of imagery, the most important point in the relation to Hardy's use of imagery and you make that up into your pair of paragraphs. That means you can get that done and move on to the final two. I think really when you think about it, the imagery that you have here, the best connection that you have is the idea of the comical images of the insect world combined really with the extended metaphors that are not comic at all. They're serious, they're deadly, they're lethal in relation to the trout. And the key point of contrast there that in some ways the anthropomorphism of the animals in the natural world in Hardy's poem uh, make them seem whimsical, make them seem comical and there's an irony there because the poem is meant to be about Hardy uh, or the speaker thinking about the insect world as on a par with humans or even surpassing humans and yet is it not a little bit superior to make the animals seem comedic? I, I think perhaps you could argue that. Whereas with Hard, uh, with Heaney then, don't you wish they had two different names that didn't begin with H? But with, let's call him Seamus, right? But with Seamus then, you have the idea that the imagery is all about power, it's all about force, the semantic field of weaponry. There's nothing comic there at all because what we've got is no sense of the human involvement. It's all about that animal as a potent force in its all world. A lethal, cold-blooded volley um, of, of shots. It's just about power and action. Um, almost metallic, isn't it? Everything seems metallic. Everything seems cold to the touch. And again, that idea that sensory descriptions are, are, are embedded there in the use of imagery. Whereas for Hardy... It, it's more to do with the anthropomorphism of the animals, making them seem almost human. And, and, and again, there's a lovely irony in that that you'd like to go on and talk about for ages, but hey, let's not bother. 
Okay, <clears throat> we're nearing the end then, folks. Rhythm and rhyme. Again, rhythm and rhyme has to relate to A01, the natural world. So you have to see what is there that I can talk about here that I can link to the natural world. And for example, the idea of the, the lack of rhyme scheme for Seamus's poem, well, that, that's important because this is a creature of instinct. This is a creature of rapidity of movement. This is a creature that forges its own path, that, that um, is not regulated, is not constrained in, in that environment. And therefore, the lack of rhythm perhaps reflects that um, sense of, of a lack of constraint, that, that it can go its own way, that there isn't um, a patterned form of behaviour here. It does what it wants to do. It's its own autonomous force. Whereas you've got a simplicity of end rhyme here, with Hardy's poem, which mimics the simple message of of the of the piece, it it's got a deliberacy to it. Um, he's pondered it, and you have that idea that the end rhyme there makes the the simple message, the simplicity of the message clear. Nice wee word for the central message, tenant. You can have that. Which is more effective, do you think? Well, it's entirely up to you. Perhaps the simplicity of the end rhyme makes it seem almost like almost like a, a a naive or a childish view of the natural world perhaps I don't know it's really up to you whereas I like the spontaneity of the unregulated lack of of rhythm and rhyme or sorry lack of rhyme in Seamus's poem I prefer that because really what he's doing is he's giving you so many elements that mimic the force of the trite and the lack of rhyme there means that you just don't know where this poem's going whereas you do have a sense um that Hardy's poem with its end rhyme is perhaps a little bit easier to connect with you know where it's going and that may not be as interesting for you as a reader tone tone is so important and tone's one of those ones that you really have to get your your own real um i suppose your own real approach to sort it you can if you wish use tone as a, a pair of paragraphs that can come at any point i have tone at the end because that's how we spell flirt but tone can be at any point you could have tone after your little paragraph on context and theme you could have tone after your paragraph and language it's really up to you the other thing is tone can be embedded into any of the paragraphs on language and imagery or even rhyme and rhythm. You can bring that in, but it has to be there, folks. It has to be there. You do have to focus on tone. And again, just like we did with the imagery, what you want to do is read through the flirt grid and see where the connections lie. See what's the best thing that I can say about tone. Now remember, tone is subject to change. I would say that primarily you have tonal changes with hardy, more than you do with Heaney. That's, that's the key thing. But sometimes it's the change of tone that's more important. And, and if you're talking about tone where there is a change in tone, then you have to recognise that tonal change and what the effect of that tonal change is. So, for example, if we look at Hardy's poem then, the tonal change starts off with that sort of nonchalant, detached tone. Um, he's got an idea that he's alone and he welcomes the isolation. So the tone is one of a um, relaxed isolation. But as the poem develops, that change that changes from relaxed isolation of the opening stanza, perhaps to the sense of confusion um, that we had at the end of the of the poem. So the tone changes from maybe the positivity of relaxed isolation to the negativity of that confusion at the end. Whereas when we're talking about Seamus's poem, the tone there is all the way through this idea that he's trying to reflect the qualities of the trite. And therefore, what he's doing is he's doing that in a very 
in a very objective way. The tone is objective all the way through. It's detached all the way through and it doesn't really change. The only thing that you could say at the end of that, the little couplet at the end of the poem, perhaps there, there's a sense of admiration um, clearer in the last couplet. But I think the admiration is actually all the way through. So tonal change is more important for Hardy than it is for Seamus. And you'll have to have that paragraph on tone. Folks, the flirt grid tells you everything you need to know. That's true. But it's the reader response. It's you actually getting to grips with how that makes you feel, what you think is best that will make your piece shine. Remember that that reader response is about evaluation. Do not feel that you cannot criticise the poet. After all, you know, this is, a, this is about you. As much as it's about them, it's about you. Don't say silly things like I think this poem is I think this poem is boring or this is this is something that I just don't understand. You know, th those are those are kind of like moody teenager phrases that the examiner doesn't really want to hear. What you want to do is try to be as articulate with your evaluation as possible. If you think one thing works better than another, tell us why you think that works better. And that'll all be based on the effects of the language. And remember, the effects of the language are detailed in your flirt grid. You can't go wrong as long as you know your flirt grids in and out. And you also think about this P-E-T-E-R structure. Okay, that's us.